What's up guys, Mr. Slint here with another episode of Slint Talk discussing competitive 6v6 TF2. Today's topic of discussion is coaches. Should coaches be allowed to compete? What level of involvement should coaches have in the competition? What level of communication should the coaches be able to have with the players? Should the coaches be able to talk to the players in game all the time, feed them strategies, you know, play call, keep track of things? Or should the coaches be restricted to only be able to talk to players at certain times? This has been a hot topic, not only within our community, but within the larger esports community where in, you know, Counter-Strike is the, the best example. Valve recently put out a memo saying that they're not going to allow coaches to talk to the players in game at their events. And so this has sent a little ripple within the esports community and uh, Thorn put out a video, Samler put out a video. I've watched a lot of what other people have had to say about this topic, but I wanted to give you guys my own opinion on this and tell you about how this affects TF2 and what I think TF2 should do in the future. So let's talk it, let's bring it into context. Last weekend at I-58 was the world championship for TF2, the top teams in the world, all going to England to see who's going to be the best. And the, the two teams, the two best teams in the world were two European teams. One was called Crowns and the other one was called Full Tilt. Now Crowns narrowly defeated Full Tilt 3-2 to two in the grand finals. And Crowns had a in-game coach and Full Tilt did not. So a lot of people look at that competition and they ask, well, you know, did that make a difference? It's three to two is a fairly close competition there, right? So did having that coach make the extra difference? Did it give them the extra little edge they needed to win? Or did it not make a difference at all? You know, would Crowns have done just as well had they not had that coach? Would full, t would full tilt, if they had an in-game coach, would they have done better? These are all questions that people are asking. It's hard to know the, the, the truth of it all because we'll never see that ever happen again. But hey, it's worth thinking about because that sets a precedent for the future, right? If at the World Championship for TF2, they're allowing coaches, then maybe they should allow coaches at other events. I personally don't think so, but let's look at what Valve has to say. So Valve says, with unrestricted communication with their players, coaches can currently function as a sixth player and not solely as a source of guidance or training. Activities such as keeping track of the economy, calling plays, and general situational awareness are important components of CS gameplay. If a person is performing these actions, we consider them a player. Since the goal of our events is to identify the best five player CS teams that can exhibit the best combination of all CS skills, the current participation of coaches in the game is not compatible with that goal. And so then they go on to say that they're no longer going to be allowing coaches to participate in, in the actual in-game communication that they're going to instead only allow coaches to talk at certain timeouts at halftime and obviously before and after the competition. Now, if we look back at TF2, the coaches for TF2 were actually very experienced players. You know, for Crowns, you had Kytus, who is a premiership level demo man, very mechanically talented, very skilled. He knows a lot about the game. He's been playing at a high level for what well, seems like forever. A very good player to have, but what you know, Kytus has is that he has this uh, he has this wrist injury. It's fairly well known. He's got he's got a problem where like he he gets like a wrist strain. So if he plays for too long, he, there's a lot of pain in his wrist, and he cannot continue to play. So that's why he's kind of taking this back seat as a coach. For the other team, Full Tilt, they also had a coach. According to Sideshow, Ips was the coach for uh, for Full Tilt, and he was coaching them online while they were practicing, and but. His involvement in their team was a little bit was was much less because um, he was not making the in-game calls necessarily. He was just kind of giving them guidance. So that's where it becomes asking the question of like, is a coach in-game guidance or is it supposed to be keeping track of stuff for you? Is it supposed to be play calling for you? Is it supposed to be that that extra ear that you need? Now my gut feeling tells me like if I were to just think about the situation. Uh, I always use the extremes, right? So imagine if your team was just entirely brain dead, like just your team just had no idea how to play the game at all. They just, they just walked around in circles, but they were very mechanically talented. And you put a guy like Kytus in there who knows what's going on, who can tell everybody what to do and, and make the right decisions at the right times. And he's not really focusing on aiming. So he's instead using his brain power to actually, uh, you know, use all of his focus, 100% of his focus on making the right decision every single time. That sounds like a big advantage to me. That sounds like a player. That sounds exactly what Valve is describing. Um, and, you know, other people seem to, think, seem to think so too. If you look at the memes on the forums, they're hilarious. Uh, one of my favorites is this picture of Eckstein doing the post-match interview with uh, with Crowns and 
and there's a numbers over people's heads, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the, you know what's really funny, and if you look at this picture, is that Eckstein, you know, very fittingly, is interviewing Kytus, the in-game coach for Crowns, and he's he's even wearing a jersey, right? So it, it begs the question, like, well, you know, did you have that advantage? Like, is that really fair? So let's look at the counterpoints. Let's look at what other people are saying. A lot of people are saying that it's fair because both teams get one. It's fair because you know, full full tilt, if they wanted to have a coach, they could have had one, man. Like, even if Ips couldn't have shown up to the event, they could have gotten someone else. They could have brought someone with them to say, hey, look, like, we're, we're going to have this guy help help us out in game as well, too. It doesn't have to be Ips. It doesn't have to be this, this coach that you've been working with for a long time. It could be some other dude. It could be your friend who just happens to play at a high level. That could have worked just fine. Maybe. Um, but I would argue a couple things against that. First of all, just because both teams get one doesn't mean it's the best thing for a competition. Sure, it's fair, but like, let's say we give both teams aim hacks. It's like, yeah, that's fair. We, we all have aim hacks now, but is that the best thing for competition? No. So just because both teams have a coach doesn't mean that having a coach is the best thing for the competition. Um, and to Valve's point, they're, for them, they're trying to find the teams that exhibit the best combination of all of CS skills. They want to find the best five players possible that are well-rounded, that have a good understanding of the game, that have good mechanical skill, that can win as just those five. Obviously, you can get guidance. Obviously, you can get some training help. But I think that that, that is valuable. Um, whereas it's not as valuable to have, you know, a bunch of players that are not as well-rounded, but you're making up for their deficiencies with a coach. The other issue that I have with that argument of it's fair, both teams could have had one, is that it comes down to an issue of resources a lot of times. And in a game like TF2, which is such a, such a young esport in that sense, just a, or such a, a small esport, there's not a lot of resources. It's not like all these teams have tons of money to throw around that you could just fly anybody out to your events. It's that it doesn't work like that at all. Actually, you know, these are bedroom gamers, so. You can't really say that it's it's fair because both teams can have a coach. It's like, well, Crowns went the extra mile to bring their coach with them, and Full Tilt did not have the same ability to do so. So I, 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 that's how I look at it, but let's look at the other counterpoints. People on the forums were saying that, what's the big deal? Kaidus didn't really say that much. He only had a couple opportunities to speak during the entire event. You know, game moves pretty quickly. It's not like he had a major impact on the competition. To that point, I'll bring up the picture again and say, look, he's wearing a jersey. But no, really, uh, a backup would have been wearing a jersey as well, right? So let's ask the real question, like, does does it really matter? And I mean, you could just go the other way. You could just say, like, if it doesn't matter, why do you need him, right? Like, oh, well, if he doesn't provide any value to you at all, then then you should have no problem with not allowing him in the competition anymore because that keeps it fair, right? Like, if, if he does matter, if he's an integral part of your team, then it does make a difference. So having him there clearly provides some level of value to your team. Otherwise, you wouldn't have him there. And so it makes it, it makes sense. It, it, if you look at it that way, it's very clear to say see that like there's at least a minuscule amount of value there. It might not be game breaking. It might not be like the end of the world, but it's something, right? So that that counts. Um, but. Let's look at the other the other points. Uh, actually, probably the probably the best argument that I've heard for why you should should allow an in-game coach is that it makes the game played at a higher skill level, which increases the entertainment value. And when you think about it that way, that's pretty mind blowing. It's like, wow, we just want to see people playing the game at the highest level possible because that's entertaining. So if everybody's playing the game at a high level and they're playing at the highest level possible, that you're, you're bringing in extra resources, you're making the team larger than six to ensure that everyone's playing the highest level of TF2 at all times, that might be more entertaining. Maybe so, maybe that is more entertaining, but in that case, I, and I like to use extremes, why don't we go the other way then? Why don't we just allow six coaches? You know, Why don't we have one coach for each player? Why, don't, why have six players when you could have you know, two players at each computer and one person is doing all the aiming and the other person is doing all the decision making. Like, it, it becomes really extreme, right? And I think that just because a game is played at a higher skill level 
doesn't mean that's the best thing for the competition. Probably one of the best arguments that I heard for not having the coaches is that the developers want the experience that we have as players in matchmaking. So when I go home and I'm sitting and, I, uh, and I'm watching I-58 and I'm watching all these best players play and I want to go home and do the same thing myself, I want to feel like it's achievable. I want to feel like I saw them do it. I can do it too. I don't want it to feel like what they're doing is so far out of reach that I can't do it at all. And so when I go home, I don't have someone here sitting next to me telling me what to do. I don't have a coach who's going to micromanage me and keep track of things for me. So in that sense, the experience for everybody should be the same. I think this is a, a common theme in esports is that the experience that you know this player gets should be the same experience that I get. And in that sense, we can find who is the best competitor. So I, I disagree with that, that argument. I think that, yeah, the game could be played at a higher skill level. But then again, I always go back to like, oh, what if you gave everyone wall hacks? Or what if you gave everyone uh, aim bots? Then it's like, yeah, then the game's played at the highest level possible, but you're not really playing the game anymore. So I, I think it should be obtainable for everybody. Um, so those are some of my initial thoughts about coaching in 6v6. So let's talk about how do we fix this for the future. Um, it's very clear that Valve has taken a stance as far as Counter-Strike goes, and why shouldn't we take the same stance as them? I mean, TF2 is made by the same developer, so if TF2 ever got big enough, they'd probably enforce the same rule. It, it makes sense that way, unless the Counter-Strike rule got changed. Like, why would they enforce this rule only in one game? They would enforce this rule in Dota as well, and probably in TF2. So I think we should follow the, uh, the, the Valve's rule on this one, because it makes sense to me you want to find the six best TF2 players on one team. Um, and then also the issue of resources that I brought up earlier, I think that if there were to be more competitions for TF2, I don't think it would be as easy to consistently bring your coach to everywhere with you, and that would, that would be a problem. So rather than have this problem of how do we get the coach to come out, why don't we just not have coaches? Uh, yeah, seems nice to me. I mean, you, uh, I think if TF2 were to grow, it would get to a point where you do have coaches, but you don't necessarily have to have a coach like in game with you telling you turn left turn right shoot this guy okay they have low money like or you know they're they're 10 seconds away from uber charge or whatever it is i think it's just uh it's a little bit much um i think that as a community we should definitely come to a decision soon because it definitely screws over some teams in the future if we don't make that decision so let's say for example we've set this precedent that coaches are allowed well, other teams for I-61, they're planning for next year already, and they're saying, hey, look, coaches are allowed, then we should allow, we should, we should get ready for next year. We should, we should get our coach. So they plan out this whole organizational, you know, structure for their team where the coach is calming these things and the, the players are just focused on their games. And then three months away from the event, we just say, oh yeah, no coaches allowed. And they're like, wow, we practiced for nine months for this and this is, you just changing it up on us, this changes everything, right? And it goes the other way too, right? Where you say, okay, uh, let's pretend, like a lot of teams think that there's not, there's, you know, not supposed to have a coach. Then people are practicing with no coach all year round. And then suddenly you allow a coach that allows some team to just pull in a coach real quick and get it an easy advantage. Um, and, you know, it, it makes a big difference when a team is making a decision, when a high level team is making a decision as far as which player they pick up it does make a difference. Being able to have those in-game calling abilities, the leadership skills, that does make a big difference as far as which players you decide to pick up. And if you had a coach who could make decisions for your players, then you don't need to pick up players that are as strong in the game sense area so much as they are in the mechanical skill area. So I think that we should get moving on this quickly, come to a decision, and I think that the right decision is to limit the power of coaches in-game.